Good morning, ladies. Um, we're just going to continue like we normally would have ladies class. And um, we always start every Wednesday morning um, with a prayer. And so I would like to do that at this time. If you'll bow with me, please. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we are so honored to come before you, the most awesome and powerful being in the whole world, dear Lord. We know that you're in control of all things. And what an amazing thing that you hear our prayers. We are very thankful and we are very mindful of all the things that you have given us, our abilities, our gifts, our families, our homes, and our daily bread. Please help us to never take more than we need and to find and find contentment in what you have provided for us. Our nation is sick. They are sick physically. You know all of these things. And we know that you have the power to heal. We ask for healing. We ask for comfort for those who are hurting right now. We know that you are good at life. You're good at giving life. You're good at preserving life. And we ask you to do that this time. Your son came and he healed physical sickness. But he came for something much more than that, dear Lord. He came to heal us spiritually. Please help us during these times to look to Jesus. You are the great planner and you are in control of all things. Help us to put our faith and our trust into your hands. Help us to find healing in your words and healing in your promises, dear Lord. As we study today, open our word, open our hearts to your word, dear Lord, and help us search for the truth. We ask all these things in your precious son's name. Amen. Um, normally after we say our prayer, we usually sing a couple of songs. And I don't really want to sing a solo to you today. But I do want to share, um, I'm going to share two songs this morning. One at the end of the lesson and one now. And this one is called He is Near. And I just want to read some of the words of this song. <clears throat> it's in this really, really old songbook. So it says, "'Twas Christ my Lord who came to share." my greatest joy and my deepest care i cast on him my every fear content to know that he is near my savior's love counts not the cost he paid the price upon the cross redeemed am i there is no fear for christ my lord is always near alone with christ or midst the throng no tempter snare shall lead me wrong i found a friend whose love is true i'll walk with him the journey through i'm glad each day though billows roll there's not to dread he keeps my soul tis sweet to know when life is over i'll live with him forevermore my savior's love counts not the cost he paid the price upon the cross redeemed am i there is no fear for christ my lord is always near sometimes when i get to feeling discouraged or um, worried or concerned about things it helps me to open up some of these songs and read the words um, they are powerful and they can really set your mind at ease we're going to talk a little bit more about that we are studying right now in the book of Matthew. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to open it to Matthew 11. That's where we are. We're just going to continue on like we normally would. Um, I have missed a couple of weeks. I was out of town, and I have really missed a uh, ladies Bible class and being able to get up and talk to you today. But we're going to be in Matthew 11, and I'm going to kind of give you an overview of some of the things we've been talking about. Um, John the Baptist um, is in prison. Things are beginning to change. Jesus was out healing the sick. He was kind of a popular guy. He talked like nobody else could speak during those times. And he was gathering quite an audience of followers that followed him. It was, it was popular. Um, John the Baptist, however, things have kind of turned for him. He's, he's in prison now. And of all the people, John the Baptist has some doubt because he sends his own disciples to Jesus to ask, are you the one? And he's like, my goodness, this is John the Baptist that saw Jesus coming and said, look, behold, the Lamb of God. He baptized Jesus. He saw, he saw the Spirit descend on him like a dove. He heard a voice from heaven, and now he has doubt about 
hey, are you the guy that's supposed to be coming or were we supposed to expect somebody else? And you think, how? How could he do this? But I, I think about us right now, too. We have faith. We believe in God. You're here listening to me. We're here opening the Word of God to our lives, and yet sometimes we have doubt. And maybe this is one of those times for you. John the Baptist was just human. He had some doubts. So when the disciples, when John's disciples came to Jesus and asked him that, Jesus was like, you know what? You tell him. Go back and tell him what you've seen. Go back and tell him what you've seen. Go back and tell him what you have heard. You've got two witnesses here. The things I'm doing and the things I'm saying. And you go back and you tell that to John the Baptist. Well, there's crowds of people around Jesus. Crowds of people. And I think he, he wants to kind of defend John's honor. He doesn't want people to think, hey, uh, this guy's doubting. I'm, you know, I'm just not so sure. They didn't, he didn't want them to have a negative reaction of John or a distorted image of John. And so he's going to defend John. At the same time he's defending John, he is um, rebuking the crowds of people that are around him for their lack of faith, you know. Um, he, he asked the people, he says, what did you go out there to see? If you go back, uh, let's just look real quick at verse 7 of chapter 11 of Matthew. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out in the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet yes I tell you and more than a prophet this is the one about whom it is written I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you he defends John he says he is not like some reed in the wind that when the wind blows it just bends over that's not your God this is a man of conviction this is a man of fire this is not that kind of guy what did he look like even brings up what did he look like well John has always had this appearance of looking a little bit like Elijah. You know, he wore fur. He wore a leather belt around his waist. He ate weird things like locusts and stuff like that. You know, and Jesus brings up his appearance. And I think that's very interesting. And basically he says, you know, this guy is not soft like a man that lives in a palace and wears fine clothes. This man is tough. He goes, in fact, he's so tough. If you remember, he was prophesied about he prophesied about me, but there were prophecies about this man, John. He backs him up. Jesus does not want to leave any doubt in these people's, not, people's minds about John the Baptist. Um, we've studied this before. We've said that John the Baptist's message was basically, repent for the heaven, the kingdom of heaven is near. Well, Jesus' message is the same. Now they were beginning to reject John. And I can tell you that Times are beginning to change for Jesus also. They will reject Jesus as well as John the Baptist. Same message, same message. And I need to say, what is the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven is near. What is it that they were telling people? We've talked over and over about in this class about what the kingdom of heaven meant. The kingdom of heaven is going to be the church as it is today. It is near. John was saying, it is close at hand. Jesus was saying the same thing. In fact, after we get through the Gospels and the book of Acts, the church will be established. The church was near. The kingdom of heaven was near. There's going to be something different about the way that you've been having to live your lives. The yoke of the Pharisees that has been on you and heavy upon you. Something's going to change. Anyway, Jesus defends John the Baptist. We get to this part in about verse 16. Uh, oh, well, let me just go back. Let's just look at verse 15. The last thing he says about John the Baptist is he says, He who has ears, let him hear. You hear that over and over again. And Jesus is just saying, You better pay attention to what he had to say. He who has ears, let him hear. Be careful. Give careful consideration to what John had to say. Okay? It was important. It was important. So then we get to verse 16. And he goes into this this detail <clears throat> that I think is, is kind of humorous. It says, to what can I compare this generation? Now he's going to turn the tables and start talking about them. They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge for you and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say he had a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say he is a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. 
but wisdom is proved right by her action. What in the world does he mean by that? Well, first of all, the first thing that he says that I think is kind of funny is that he compares them to children that are in marketplaces. You know, my marketplace is right down the road. It's called H-E-B. And lately, when I have gone to H-E-B, strange things are going on in there. There's no toilet paper, which is really strange. I have pictures on my phone of a whole aisle that's totally empty of toilet paper. I'm like, what in the world? You know, why, why are people buying so much toilet paper? But it is funny to me that Jesus uses this comparison. Here we are talking about it this morning, and we're talking about marketplaces. And he says, there's children in marketplaces. And it, and it says they're sitting in the marketplaces, but they're calling out to one another. They're calling out to one another, let's play a game. They say, let's play a game, okay? I just want you to know there were several things about a marketplace, first of all. It was a place of idleness in the Bible. Even Matthew 20, verse 3 backs that up, that it was a place where people sat and they were idle. They didn't do anything. Maybe they were people watching. It's kind of like going to the mall and watching people. Who knows? It was also a place of worldly business. And I dare say that today, H-E-B is a place of worldly business. It was a place of distraction. Are we not totally distracted right now? Almost our, our vision has become dis, distorted in a sense. There's a lot of noise and chaos and things. You see everybody else buying all these things up and you think, oh, I need to do that too. A lot of distraction. So it's interesting that he uses the marketplace as a, as a this is where the children are and this is what they're playing. Okay, so then he says, we played the flute for you. A group of children comes in and they say, hey, let's play a happy game. Whenever there's flute playing, it's a celebration, perhaps even a wedding. Let's play wedding today. But the other group of children says, no, no, we don't want to play that. No, we don't want to play that. So the first group says, well, let's play something sad. We sang a dirge. Let's play funeral together. No, we don't want to play that either. But basically, Jesus was saying, here's John the Baptist who's come to you. He lives in the desert. He wears all these furs. He eats bugs all the time. You don't like him. You, don't, you won't listen to him. You won't listen to his message. No, nope, we're not playing that game. But then here I come, the Son of Man. I come, and I'm playing a different tune. I'm healing people. I'm touching lepers. I am calling tax collectors. I'm going into their house and eating with them. But you don't want to play that game either. You don't want to play what John the Baptist has to play, but you don't want to play what I have to play either. He's pointing out something. Here are two different guys, two different ways of presenting gospel. Two different ways. You won't listen to either one of them. Your eyes are blind and you have closed off. The last part of verse 19, but wisdom is proved right by her actions. You know, no matter what approach a teacher or a preacher uses, some men will never be pleased with that. But sooner or later, they'll be justified. Wise men will justify the conduct of both Jesus and John the Baptist. And those that do not put themselves out of the category of the wise. Jesus is blunt. Yeah, but wisdom is proved right by her actions. Okay, so we get finished with all of this. Uh, one other one, there's one other point I want to talk about just real quick. And it's about that, the happy times and the sad times. You know, God has a way of using whatever it is to his advantage. He will use the happy times in our lives to his advantage and to reach as many people as he can. He will also use the sad and hard times to reach the people that he needs to reach. So that's very interesting that uh, this came into play today as I'm getting ready to do this, I think. Oh, God has a way of putting the things that we need into perspective today at the right moment, at the right time. 
It's really good. Let's go on. We get to verses 20. Now, I'm going to read verses 20 of chapter 11 of Matthew till the very end because I believe it all ties in together. So I'm going to start reading in verse 20. Then Jesus began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Verse 25. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So you say, how in the world are we going to tie all this in together? Well, um, I think he's going to develop a logical argument here, Jesus is. And the very first thing he he does is he announces doom on these places that refuse to repent. And that's verses 20 through 24. The second thing he does is he announces that all revelation from God is coming through him. It's coming through Jesus Christ. And the third thing is he offers an invitation to come to him. He is the perfect gospel preacher. He's got it down. Um, he gives condemnation, he gives revelation, he gives invitation, all three. Whenever we hear a teacher or a preacher or evangelist giving their messages to someone or a group of someone, we first hear how very much we need forgiveness, and we do. But then we hear who's going to give us that forgiveness, and then we hear the benefits of said forgiveness. So Jesus here gives us the perfect pattern to follow whenever we need to teach someone. And we do need to teach others. We need to tell others. There's something about the way that Jesus presents this that gets our attention too. So the very first thing he does is he starts talking about these places. And it's doom and gloom for these places, basically. But the, but the names of these cities that he brings up, you can just tell these Jewish people and this crowd of Jews perks up. One of the first places he mentions is Tyre and Sidon. Do you even know what Sidon is? Tyre and Sidon were these places where they worshipped idols. There is one notable character in our Bible that came from Sidon. She was a Sidonian, and that was Jezebel. And when she came into Israel, she brought with her Baal and Asheroth. They worshipped they had a distorted image of who to worship. But they worshipped idols, some of the worst in the world. Of all the places for Jesus to bring up, he brings up Sidon. Ding, 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 ding. If I were a Jew, I'd be like, whoa. But he tells them, if the miracles that I have been performing in front of you had been performed for them, they would have repented. He isn't done. He keeps going. He brings up another one, Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah, those were the places that were destroyed by God, totally destroyed by God. Again, very distorted, uh, distorted way of worshiping, a wrong way of worshiping. And yet he says, if they had had the miracles that I have been performing in these cities around you, they would have repented. Wow. That's harsh. I think, wow, um, it's amazing. Uh, they would have repented if they had had the revelation that these people had been privileged to have. 
You know, those people, the Jewish people, thought they knew God. In fact, they thought they were privileged more than everybody else. They had blinders on. I'm not going to listen to anything this guy has to say. But God's saying, you know what? If you reject me, you have rejected God himself. You have had witnesses. You have had the witness of me performing all these miracles. And you have had the witness of my words. And you are rejecting me. So it's interesting. Now we move on to the part where he reveals himself to them. But the, before he does that, and I think this is very interesting, verse, 20, verse 25, at that time, he has just been talking about all of these things um, that are going to happen to these people because they refuse to repent. And what does he do at that very moment? He looks up into heaven and he gives thanks to God. I found that very interesting. He thanks him for revealing the mysteries of the gospel to little children. What in the world does he mean by that? What is he talking about? A child doesn't know anything. A child has to be taught from the beginning. They don't know anything. We're responsible for teaching them. They have to be taught everything. He is contra contrasting the normal Jewish person to a child the Jews have been trained in the law since they were born. They were intelligent. They were learned people. Sounds familiar. I know a whole bunch of people in America that are considered smart, intelligent, learned, educated people. But God's saying it will be revealed to a child. All of that learning kept them from seeing what they really needed to see. Instead, a Gentile knew very little about Jesus. They knew little about Jewish law. They had never been taught anything. Perhaps they were a little bit more open to what Jesus had to say. Later on, um, in Matthew 23, verse 37, Jesus will weep for Jerusalem and its inhabitants. He will weep for them. But in this moment... He is thanking God that the truth has been revealed to a people that were like children. You know, there's a bunch of lessons here, but one that I really picked up on. DC pointed it out early on Sunday in his lesson on Sunday about being thankful, about being thankful. And here is an example of Jesus doing that very thing. We can take great encouragement in looking upward to God when round about us we see nothing but what is discouraging right now. If you've got that news on all day long, you might take a break from it because it can be very discouraging to us. People are critical of one another, accusing one another. I don't think at this time that that is what we need, you know. Thanksgiving is a proper answer to dark and disquieting times and thoughts. It can be very effective, dare I say, a cure to be thankful for what he has given us. This is our time to be thankful. When we have no other answer ready for our grief or our fear, we need to be on our knees and thanking him for what he has done in our lives. That song, Count Your Many Blessings, can change your perspective about things very quickly. So, you know, I, I think there's a lot to be said for that, and Jesus offers an example of that gloom and doom, and right here, I'm going to thank God for what he has done and what he has accomplished. And I think that is great. He goes on in the next first couple of verses to things. Oh, by the way, um, I'm going to ask you to radically change your way of thinking. Radically change your way of thinking. Everything that I am telling you is coming from God. Everything. If you can't believe me, you can't believe him. You can't. Um, and then he's going to offer something. He wants you to change. But he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I dare say that right now we're burdened. We're burdened with a lot of things. And what does he tell us to do? Learn of me. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. The way to spiritual rest for the soul is to believe in Jesus. 
and Jesus reveals the Father, and He alone reveals the Father. And how can you know? Because of what He's done. What He's done in your life. In the Bible, it was what the miracles that He had performed. Matthew kind of changes the order of that. He says, these miracles reveal that He is the Lord. And as the Lord, He alone can reveal what the Father wants Him to know. So people should place their spiritual lives under his control. And that's the order he gives it. The last little part of this is, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says there is something very, very different about the yoke that you have been under. The unbearable yoke of the Pharisees. They ask you to do this and this and this and this. My yoke is easy. I'm asking you for a radical change in your life. A radical change. Stop thinking that you know everything. That you're and lean upon me. Learn of me. Open your Bibles up. Read what read what it has to tell you and read what it has to say. It will make a difference in your life. Um, Jesus' invitation calls for radical change, but he gave staggering promises to it. Learn of me. They're going to have to make a decision. Submit to the authority of Jesus, and you will find everlasting rest. And isn't that what we want today? Just get through today. But open your Bibles and spend some time in the Word. We have a, a tremendous gift right now. My family is at home with me. We've had some incredible uh, time together, which we haven't had. I've been able to do things that I haven't been able to do in a long time. Clean that one drawer in the, refer in the, in the kitchen that's full of everything in the world. Uh, go through my closet and get rid of some stuff, you know. Things I haven't had time to do. What a gift to be with family right now. I'm thinking about buying a turkey and having a Thanksgiving dinner just for the fun of it, you know. We've got some tremendous gifts. If you're feeling discouraged, if you're doubting, open up God's Word and see what He has to say with you. And, and by all means, spend some time thanking Him for the wonderful gifts that He's given us. Uh, to close today, I want to read one more song that um, is one of my favorite songs in the world. It's called, He Will Pilot Me. And so let's look at it. I'm going to read the words. Although I cannot see the way or life's tempestuous sea, I know that Jesus is my friend and that he'll pilot me. By his hand, he'll pilot me over life's tempestuous sea when my blinded eyes can't see, cannot see the way. Come what may, come what may on life's dark and stormy sea, my dear Lord, my blessed Lord, he will pilot, he will pilot me. I hope you have a wonderful day and hope we can do this again sometime.